Hey everyone, Laszlo Montgomery again, bringing you another tasty morsel from Chinese history. For the 55% of my listeners who are not of this land of the free, home of the brave, I'm guessing you might be disappointed to see yet another American-themed topic. After such a long wait, too. And if you're wondering why a topic like this is being covered in the China History Podcast, there actually is some history behind this, and that's what I wanted to cover here. So just in time for the holidays, I figured this would be a nice, light, flavorful topic that we could ride out the end of the year with. And besides, no matter what you think of Chinese food, love it, like it, or hate it, it truly is one of the Middle Kingdom's greatest cultural exports, certainly to this country. It's right up there alongside martial arts, Chinese fashions, and aesthetics. There are hundreds of thousands of Chinese restaurants around the world and more than 40,000 in the U.S. alone. The reason I thought this might be a nice episode was that I found two books that were just brilliant in their total immersion of the topic. Whereas I'm only focusing on the history here, these two books offer up the whole Las Vegas-style buffet of information about Chinese food in America, how it got here, and most interestingly, how it was all tied up with the experience of early Chinese immigrants in the U.S. The first book was Andrew Koh's 2009 work entitled Chop Suey, A Cultural History of Chinese Food in the United States. That's from Oxford University Press. I'm going to use a few priceless quotes from Andrew Koh's book in this podcast. The other one was uh, Jennifer Eight Lee's New York Times bestseller, The Fortune Cookie Chronicles, Adventures in the World of Chinese Food. That came out in 2008 and was published by Twelve, uh, an imprint of Grand Central Publishing. These two books, plus the usual assortment of odds and ends I gleaned using Baidu and the Google, provided most of the info presented here today. The whole matter of how Chinese cuisine came to America and how it was perceived, welcomed, and rejected by everyone who came in contact with it is it's actually quite interesting and has a historic angle. Last episode, we looked at the time when an American vessel first visited China, right after this new nation was established. And this was the story of the merchant vessel Empress of China and the events that followed all the way up to Caleb Cushing's visit to Canton and the Treaty of Wangxia, signed between China and the U.S. in 1844. Today we pick up shortly thereafter when the people in America first began to interact with Chinese, or celestials as they were called by many in those days. The history of Chinese food in America naturally begins when Chinese first started arriving en masse during the days right after gold was discovered at Sutter's Mill on January 24th, 1848. Within two years, the population of San Francisco increased 20 times. Once word reached China about the gold rush and the rich pickings in America, it led to a flood of immigration from southern Guangdong to the U.S. West Coast. Most of these Chinese who came were from an area within the geographic triangle of Kaiping, Taishan, and Xinhui. These cities are all located on the western edge of the Pearl River Delta in southern Guangdong. When the floodgates opened, amongst the thousands and thousands of Chinese who began the perilous and uncertain journey to the Golden State, were restaurateurs who packed up all their pots and pans and ingredients that they figured they couldn't get in California. And these entrepreneurs knew, with so many of their kind heading to work the gold mines, they'd have to eat. And it was doubtful if the dishes they were used to could be had in this new world. As soon as many of these Chinese began pouring into Northern California, they at once began foraging for anything familiar they could find in the forests and pastures. Mushrooms, fungus, herbs, anything that looked familiar, they gathered. And since most all of these people from this region were farmers, as soon as they settled down somewhere to pan for gold or dig in the hills, they planted vegetable gardens nearby with seeds they brought with them from China. So many of these Chinese nongmin just did what came naturally to them. Already experts in China at getting as much as they could out of small patches of land they tilled, 
Their bountiful harvest in this new land was used to supply restaurants and the many grocery stores that sprang up wherever there were enough Chinese to create a market. When demand reached critical mass, export firms in Hong Kong stepped up to the plate and began supplying all these dried foodstuffs and other necessities to prepare and cook Chinese food. Along with these nongmin, these farmers, were yumin as well, fishermen, who took their expertise from China to the U.S. West Coast and began harvesting every imaginable kind of fish or crustacean that called San Francisco Bay home. The Smithsonian Institution records that the very first Chinese restaurant to open was called Macau and Wusong. The proprietor was one Norman Ah Sing, who is credited with opening the first all-you-can-eat Chinese buffet. One buck was all it cost, and it was an instant hit. In its earliest days, it was low cost that mainly defined Chinese food. Norman Ah Sing was an early pillar of San Francisco Chinese society. And besides being the first Chinese restaurateur, he is remembered as the man who stood up to California Governor John Bigler. He had written an open letter to Governor Bigler, assailing him for his anti-Chinese rhetoric of the day. And I mentioned Governor Bigler in my CHP 44 episode covering the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. He was the guy, if you recall, who had promised as part of his 1852 re-election campaign to, quote, check this tide of Asiatic immigration. I've also read that before Macau and Wusong opened their doors, they were preceded by an establishment called the Canton Restaurant that opened 164 years ago on December 10th, 1849. Besides these two, the earliest places to offer Chinese food was, they were called Wohai and Kong Sings. By 1882, there were 14 more Chinese restaurants, along with 175 Chinese laundries, 77 dry goods stores, and 62 Chinese groceries. These were the trades that most identified with the earliest Chinese immigrants. These were nice, safe businesses for Chinese because there was no open conflict with Caucasian workers. These Caucasian workers weren't going to be caught dead doing someone else's laundry or working in a restaurant. But when it came to manual labor jobs, including working the mines and the railroads, these Caucasian Americans didn't take long to start complaining about these immigrants who were stealing their jobs and depressing wages. These earliest Chinese restaurants were called chow chows. Their earliest customers were the laborers who toiled in the gold mines. In Chinatown, the laborers living on a budget would patronize these earliest eateries, usually located below street level. For a nickel or a dime, they would sit on three-legged stools or benches and enjoy a simple meal, almost like back home. All of these people from China were men, no women. They had no one to cook for them, so in order to get their three squares a day, they ate at these restaurants. Let me quote from Andrew Coe's book about what New York Tribune correspondent Bayard Taylor wrote about the Chinese restaurants in San Francisco Chinatown. Quote, There were French restaurants on the plaza and on DuPont Street, an extensive German establishment on Pacific Street, the Fonda Peruana, the Italian confectionery, and three Chinese houses, denoted by their long, three-cornered flags of yellow silk. The latter are much frequented by Americans on account of their excellent cookery and the fact that meals are one dollar each, without regard to quantity. Kong Song's house is near the water, Wang Tong's in Sacramento Street, and Tong Ling's in Jackson Street. There, the grave celestials serve up their chow chow and curry, besides many genuine English dishes. Their tea and coffee cannot be surpassed. These triangular, three-cornered yellow flags found outside of any Chinese restaurant were akin to the barber's poles that we in the States are familiar with. You know, the um, red, white, and blue twirling helix things that still to this day signify a barber shop. The earliest Chinese restaurants with their triangle yellow silk flags also had the same symbols of their trade. Later on, one of the mainstays of Chinese restaurants into the 20s would be these mechanical piano players. The Roaring Twenties, by the way, and the prohibition that set in from 1920 to 1933, beginning with the Volstead Act, 
really clobbered the restaurant industry. If people couldn't get a scotch and soda with their steak and potatoes, they just stayed home. The chop suey joints had a field day. Because they rarely served liquor at Chinese restaurants, their business boomed. A Chinese restaurant was often a destination unto itself and didn't require booze to lure in the customers. These earliest Chinese restaurants were simple and primitive. The multi-storied palaces that became the pillars of San Francisco Chinatown were still a ways off. These wouldn't come till after the 1906 earthquake. Some of these early pioneers were already in the restaurant business and had learned the ropes in Canton or in Hong Kong and Macau. Many of them were already familiar with how to prepare Chinese dishes for the white man. The earliest Chinese proprietors figured out early on the locals in the U.S. didn't take too kindly to anything that tasted too authentic. It took them about a second to learn these Americans like sweet over savory, and the crispier the better. Another thing about these restaurants that were patronized by Caucasians was that they offered Western fare right alongside the Chinese dishes. Chinese food was initially not particularly embraced by the American locals. And when the racism began to heat up in the 1860s and 70s, the revulsion of Chinese immigrants included their cuisine as well. Furthermore, no one would want to be seen frequenting any Chinese restaurants during these bad old days since it implied you weren't on board with the rest of the country as far as supporting the anti-Chinese sentiment that was prevalent you know, wherever there was a nearby Chinatown. Even during the more heated years just before the Chinese exclusion laws were enacted, there were still certain businessmen in the community who, regardless of sentiment, engaged in commerce with the Chinese and would, from time to time, get together with them and participate in these banquets usually held at the most spectacular three-story Chinatown restaurant palaces of the day. Some of the writing from those who attended these affairs is, is quite amusing. Andrew Coe had a funny quote about what someone wrote of this 19th century American Chinese food. Quote, Almost everything has the same taste of nut oil sicklied all over, and few Western palates can endure even the most delicate of their dishes. Shark's fins, stewed bamboo, duck eggs boiled, baked, and stewed in oil, pork disguised in hot sauces, and other things like these are the standard dishes of a Chinese bill of fare. Though they may have an infinite variety of sweetmeats, which are really palatable, and of sweet cakes, which are inviting in their quaint, odd forms and decorations, but are ashes and wormwood in taste. As the racism and prejudice heated up during and after the period when the Chinese Exclusion Act was passed, the jokes, myths, and urban legends about what the actual ingredients of Chinese food were began to heat up. Each claim about the dubious ingredients became more preposterous and outlandish than the next. Whatever the filthiest vermin crawling in the back alleys of Chinatown. You can trust it was rumored by the city folk to be one of the main ingredients of Chinese food. And this undeserved stereotype became even more reason to despise and look down on Chinese in American society in the wake of 1882. Samuel Gompers, one of the best known of all labor leaders, had played his part in fanning the flames of racism in 1902. The AFL founder, that's American Federation of Labor, not American Football League, uh, to justify the Chinese Exclusion Act had said, quote, Some of the reasons for Chinese exclusion, meat versus rice, American manhood versus Asiatic coolism, which shall survive? So this was the kind of talk wafting about. The difference in the way the Chinese prepared their cuisine was just another thing that the ignorant and prejudiced could point at to ensure themselves of their own superiority. But along came chop suey, which, though not an instant success, began to take hold in America as food that offered the adventurous something exotic and sophisticated. One of the pioneer Chinese eateries in San Francisco called it a dish for, quote, local artists under the influence of the Orientalist aesthetic. Unfortunately, there were no Sima Qian types back then who were chronicling the earliest days of chop suey how it was invented, who invented it, and what the actual ingredients were. I read lots of stories about how it all began, but there's hardly anything definitive that we can sink our teeth into. 
The most popular theory behind the creation of chop suey and how it made its way to America points to the good people of the area in and around Tai Shan in Guangdong province. Now, one of these days, I need to do a whole podcast series on this town because it's a very special place. The city can trace its roots back to at least the Hongwu Emperor. Yes, good old Zhu Yuanzhang, the founder of the Ming Dynasty. It's located on the west side of the Pearl River Delta, just south of Jiangmen. Between the six decades from 1850 to 1910, the people of Taishan witnessed 14 massive floods, seven typhoons, four earthquakes, two severe droughts, four epidemics, five famines, and a 12-year war that pitted the Taishan locals against the Hakkas, a conflict that ended in 1867 with over a million dead. So it's easy to see when the floodgates opened in America after the start of the gold rush, why so many of these brave Chinese immigrants came from Taishan. More than half of all Chinese immigrants in the U.S., at least up to the 1950s, came from Taishan. And it's also estimated that this number might be as high as 80%. Back in the early 80s, when I used to teach English in L.A.'s Chinatown, all of these kids I taught came from Taishan. So although this isn't by any means a fact, popular belief is that chop suey, as we know and love it, was brought to America by the good people of Taishan and that it was a dish from that little corner of Guangdong province. The name chop suey comes from the local dialect of the Mandarin word zha sui. Zha means miscellaneous and sui means bits and pieces. So it means, in short, odds and ends. It's believed that the way chop suey came about was that whoever was doing the cooking would take a bunch of leftovers or unsold vegetables, whatever was handy, and then chop everything up and mix it all together into a kind of stir-fry. There's lots of theories about this, but the truth is, who knows? It's as plausible an explanation as any of the others I've heard. Most likely, and Jennifer Aitley maintains, chop suey is almost as American as apple pie. It was invented here, and in fact, you'd be hard-pressed to find the stuff in China. Initially, the dish was called chow chop suey. It was right around the late 1890s that the word chop suey made it to the American mainstream. In the late 1800s, someone who sampled the dish in New York's Chinatown described it this way, quote, Chow chop suey was the first dish we attacked. It is a toothsome stew composed of bean sprouts, chicken gizzards and livers, calves tripe, dragonfish, dried and imported from China, pork, chicken, and various other ingredients I was unable to make out. Andrew Coe found a quote from Carl Crow himself, who we featured in CHP episode 79. Carl Crow proffered his sagacious version of the chop suey business. Quote, Soon after the discovery of gold, the Chinese colony in the city was large enough to support a couple of restaurants conducted by Cantonese cooks who catered to only their fellow exiles from the Middle Kingdom. The white man had heard the usual sailor yarns about what these pigtailed yellow men ate, and one night a crowd of miners decided they would try this strange fare just to see what it was like. They had been told that Chinese eat rats, and they wanted to see whether or not this was true. When they got to the restaurant, the regular customers had finished their suppers, and the proprietor was ready to close his doors. But the miners demanded food, so he did the best he could to avoid trouble and get them out of the way as soon as possible. He went out into the kitchen, dumped together all the food his Chinese patrons had left in their bowls, put a dish of Chinese sauce on top, and served it to his unwelcome guests. As they didn't understand Cantonese slang, they didn't know what he meant when he told them that they were eating chop suey, or beggar hash. At any rate, they liked it so well that they came back for more, and in that chance way, the great chop suey industry was established. Carl Crow, ladies and gentlemen. Li Hongzhang's visit to the USA in August 1896 helped to create a modicum of hoopla that helped launch the chop suey craze. Just as when Deng Xiaoping visited in January 1979, a sort of China mania gripped certain parts of the country. Americans were hardly used to seeing the likes of venerable characters from China, such as Li Hongzhang, who always dressed in the traditional Chinese fashion and oozed exoticness with his dress and deportment. 
Li Hongzhang, of course, was one of the major characters of the late Qing dynasty, helping to put down the Taiping Rebellion and later serving as China's best-known diplomat until his death in 1901. Americans just ate this stuff up when they read about it in The Prince. By the time he left New York City, the people who jumped on the chop suey bandwagon mushroomed. There were still no small amount of detractors who shunned this strange cuisine and the jokes and racist comments of the dubious ingredients contained in chop suey never went out of style. Whether it all began in San Francisco or New York, I I couldn't find out. The Chinese on both coasts, after seeing how the Americans took to this stuff, set out for new untapped markets inland to set up their restaurants and serve up this strange... Americanized version of their cuisine to an ever-growing, appreciative American public. There was no one single version of chop suey. Everyone had their own way of preparing it. There's an interesting story about a gent named Lem Sen, a Chinese who called San Francisco home. He made the claim that he was the inventor of chop suey. Mr. Lem Sen took this claim quite seriously, and after seeing how quickly the American public was taking to this dish like any self-respecting American might do, he sought relief in the courts to get these imitators to cease and desist with their copycat dishes. I'm going to read you a clipping I picked up courtesy of the Google from the New York Times of June 15th, 1904. It's a little long, but to be honest with you, I read it and found it terribly interesting, not only as a little vignette into turn-of-the-century attitudes towards Chinese in America, but also for the the snootiness and sense of racism that bubbles up through throughout the narrative. Then at the end, the commentator reverts to good old Charlie Chan, exaggerated pigeon Chinese accents to Ma Lam Sen. You know something, let me just read it and just groove on the kind of stuff that made it to the prince back in 1904, 110 years ago. Chop suey injunction. Lam Sen of Frisco, here to allege copyright infringement. Chinatown last night was plunged in a gloom worse than Sumerian, and notwithstanding the fact that the chop suey restaurants were more crowded than usual, there was an air of silent preoccupation overhanging the habitués of Mott and Pell Streets. The reason was that Lem Sen, recently of San Francisco, had shaken the dust of the Golden Gate from his garments and had come here armed with many legal documents which purported to show that he was the original inventor and sole proprietor of the dish known as chop suey. Lem Sen, it appears, has placed all these documents in the hands of Rufus P. Livermore, a lawyer who has an office in the St. Paul building, and it is further food for alarmist comment that the lawyer, it is said, will proceed presently to obtain an injunction in the Supreme Court restraining all Chinese restaurant keepers from making and serving chop suey. When Rufus P. Livermore was seen last night with regard to the matter, he said, I always thought chop suey was a Chinese dish until several weeks ago. Then the inventor came and said it wasn't, ventured the reporter. No, I did not get this case until two days ago. But when Prince Pu was doing Chinatown the other day, one of his escorts, who was anxious to please him, said, And now, your highness, we will eat some of your national dish, chop suey. What is chop suey? asked Prince Pu innocently. That aroused my suspicions, and they were confirmed two days later when the Frisco Chinaman came to my office and asked me to get an injunction against all persons who manufactured and served the national dish. Now, the Prince Pu referred to in this article as Pu Lun, nephew of the Guangxu Emperor who visited the U.S. as the Emperor's representative for the World's Fair in St. Louis in 1904. The piece continues, quote, According to Lem Sen, Livermore's client, chop suey is no more a national dish of the Chinese than pork and beans. The Chinaman, who says he invented it, says there is not a grain of anything celestial in it. Lem Sen, according to his own story, says that he was born in San Francisco. He was never in China. He worked for many years in a Chinese restaurant in San Francisco and was later employed in a bohemian restaurant run by an American. It was just before the arrival of Li Hongzhang on a visit to this country that a real interest in things Mongolian and celestial began, says Lem Sen. The owner of the restaurant in San Francisco, 
suggested that Lem Sen manufacture some weird dish that would pass as Chinese and gratify the public craze at the time. Lem says that it was then he introduced to the astonished world the great dish. Then he says some American man stole his recipe, his papal. This, you know, sort of goofs on the Chinese pronunciation of the word paper. And here is where this New York Times piece reverts to this, you know, mocking and comical rant from Lem Sen. If this didn't amuse the Anglos of the day, I don't know what did. It's written out phonetically like this. Now Lem Sen says, quote, Melican man make thousand dollar now. Lem Sen make two, but Ali time look for Melican man who stole me come. Me find. Now me wanty papal back and all stop make chop suey or pay me for a lawi do same. Considering that Lem Sen supposedly was born in San Francisco, I find it strange that his rant sounded as if it came from someone fresh off the boat. And besides, writers in New York had been mentioning chop suey long before Lee Hong Jung and his entourage blew into town and left. Anyways, 1904, this was the kind of stuff you might read about in the New York Times. White America was still getting a kick out of poking fun at the Chinese and society and using chop suey as the vehicle to cut them down to size. One thing to note, as far as differentiating the San Francisco and New York Chinatown immigrant experiences, was that New York was a vastly larger melting pot of people from all over the world than was San Francisco. In New York, the Chinese were simply just another group of immigrants. In San Francisco, because their numbers were so much greater and they were a larger fish in a much smaller pond, this was one reason why they were so singled out by racists and anti-immigration groups. They stuck out. In New York, the Chinese immigrants didn't face anything as intense as their West Coast cousins. The big bang as far as the proliferation of chop suey joints in America occurred right after the turn of the century. Very soon after the Lem Sen affair, that's really when the more adventurous and gutsy Chinese left the comfort and convenience of the motherships in New York or San Francisco and headed inland, hopefully to greener pastures. By the 1920s, Chop suey was wholly mainstream in American society, and there were plenty of Asian immigrants who had set up restaurants throughout the major population centers of the country. In 1923, the Los Angeles phone books counted 28 Chinese restaurants. By 1941, this number grew to 73. The San Francisco earthquake of 1906 had a huge impact on the Chinese immigrant experience. We discussed this in the Chinese exclusion episode. It had an immediate and game-changing impact on the restaurants of San Francisco Chinatown. The earthquake pretty much devastated the old Chinatown. Rising from the ashes were these Chinese-style three-story banquet houses, and dining there was a, was a must for any tourist passing through San Fran. In 1922, a company was launched in Detroit by two guys, Dr. Ilhan Nu and Wally Smith, that brought the convenience of preparing chop suey right into the American household. Now, I grew up with this stuff, and I could still remember the jingles from all their commercials that ran ad nauseum throughout the 1960s and 70s. This was none other than Le Choy Products, Inc., owned today by good old ConAgra Foods. Their bitter rival, Chung King, came along right after the end of World War II. Chung King was based way the heck up in North Minnesota, of all places, in the town of Grand Rapids. They, too, ended up under the umbrella of ConAgra, who in the mid-90s phased out this once great brand of my youth. LeChoy's ads promised American moms, quote, Now you can make genuine chop suey, or chow mein, in ten minutes. The classic recipe said, fry up some meat, add a can of LeChoy vegetables, and voila, there it is. And to top it all off, shake on Le Choy's Chinese sauce, which is what their marketing experts figured was better than calling soy sauce. The standard chop suey in America, not that I've had it in 20 years, was almost always composed of bean sprouts, water chestnuts, onions, celery, bamboo shoots, baby corn, some sort of meat, and all mixed together with some sort of medium viscosity sauce. Exotic but familiar all at the same time. If you wanted to get fancy, there was always one of the Montgomery family stalwarts, Subgum Chop Suey. I guess I always favored that one because of the catchy name. Subgum. Something about that name. 
as youngins growing up in the Chicago suburbs, dining at Nankin, Limbs, and the other chop suey joints of the day. The word sub gum always intrigued me. Wow, what could that mean? Well, many years later, I learned this is just Cantonese for shijin, which means something like numerous and varied. Sup gum. But don't quote me on those tones. This is the form of chop suey where you mix seafood and beef or pork or whatever. Hey, what did we know? Whatever the case may be, the golden age of chop suey in America, if you will, was about from the turn of the century until about 1960. Many of us in America grew up actually thinking this was the national dish of China. Back in the day, I would spoon out all that chop suey, chow mein, egg foo young, pressed duck, and mugu gai pan from those white takeout containers onto my dish, then douse everything with a healthy dose of soy sauce. And I imagine this was more or less how they did it in China, too. Those takeout containers, by the way, they had a history, too. Those iconic containers, still with us today, were patented on November 13th, 1894 by one Frederick Weeks Wilcox. Back then, before we knew them as Chinese takeaway containers, they were called paper pails. The beauty and simplicity of the product speaks for itself as far as its longevity of use. It was a single sheet of paperboard, scored and folded into a leak-proof container. It was the perfect vessel to hold anything that was wet. They were also called oyster pails for the reason that they were initially used in the oyster fishing industry. This is back in the early 20th century. It was after World War II that the Chinese restaurant owners learned that these oyster pails made the ultimate takeout boxes. None of that sauce would ever leak out, except, you know, through the top, of course. But that handy wire handle ensured that none of that sauce would get on your hands. It was human beings at their engineering finest. There's a lot of jokes in urban legends about Jewish people and their affinity for Chinese food. You know how Chinese takeaway places do such a brisk business with Jews on Christmas, you know, because everything else is closed, something like that. I've read that this love affair began back in the 1930s, when the Ashkenazi Jews began passing through Ellis Island and made it to the Lower East Side, Brooklyn, and, you know, wherever. They found something recognizable in chop suey. Jewish cuisine, like Chinese, used a lot of chicken broth, lots of garlic and onions, and both cuisines saw vegetables that were cooked down to a nice, soft texture. Both cuisines had sweet and sour dishes, and best of all, Chinese food never used dairy products. This allowed the Orthodox Jews to dig in, too, without fear of doing the unthinkable, mixing meat and dairy. This wasn't the only kosher Chinese restaurant, but it was certainly the most famous. In 1959, a gent named Saul Bernstein opened a restaurant at 135 Essex between Delancey and Houston. It was initially called Bernstein on Essex, but to those who frequented the place, it was known as Schmolka Bernstein's, quote, where kashrut is king and quality reigns. All under one roof, you could get kishka, latkes, corned beef, and Cantonese favorites like mugu gai pan and lo mein Bernstein with chicken livers. The waiters all wore Chinese skull caps with tassels rather than yamokis, and their Chinese name was Hu Po Xiansheng. Hu Po means amber. Anyways, they closed down in the mid 90s. There's also a kosher Chinese place in northeast uh, Atlanta called Chai Peking in the back of a Kroger's where I took some chasids once. I don't think the Jews like Chinese food better than anyone else, but however you look at it, the two go way back. So Americans living from the turn of the century to the end of World War II, whether we knew it or not, were living during the chop suey age. In 1945, Bu Wei Yang Chao's book, How to Cook and Eat in Chinese, came out. And by then, Chinese food had already melted into the pot of American cuisine. Pearl S. Buck wrote the foreword to that famous cookbook that first gave us the word stir-fry. As the world became smaller, particularly after 1945, culinary sophistication began to creep in. But for the most part, by the time Beatlemania hit in the U.S., chop suey had become a tired and worn-out tradition. Just when the genre needed a boost, along came the Hunan Sichuan craze of the late 60s and 70s. Lyndon Baines Johnson signed the Immigration Act of 1965, the Hart Cellar Act, 
The House voted 326 to 69 in favor of this law. You don't see too many votes like this anymore for major legislation. Anyways, this new law decisively spelled the final end for the Chinese exclusion laws, even though the act had been repealed since 1943. Now, in 1965, any Chinese who met the criteria, which was almost everyone, could immigrate to America. For the first time since 1882, the Chinese immigrants passing through the Golden Doors weren't limited to a small geographic region adjacent to the Pearl River Delta. Now, you had people from all over Taiwan applying. As soon as many of these people got settled in the U.S., they set up these restaurants that served what I recall as Mandarin food. Basically, it wasn't like the Cantonese that we all grew up with. That is to say, these newfangled dishes brought to us in part by the 1965 Immigration Act were like nothing America was normally used to. As a result of the Chinese Civil War that ended in 1949, a lot of Chinese from the mainland sought refuge in Taiwan. And these guys were were from all over China. Hunan, Sichuan, Hubei, Shanxi... Shanghai, Liaoning, Shandong, they were from everywhere. A whole new generation of entrepreneurs and restaurateurs came to the rescue right at the time when people were just getting ready to give up on chop suey. And then, just when this new generation needed a boost to their product, along comes February of 1972, and in front of the whole world, Richard Milhouse Nixon chows down on some decidedly not chop suey dishes, and he shared the meal with none other than Premier Zhou Enlai himself. A revolution was started, and these guys, mostly from Taiwan and the usual suspects, Hong Kong, Macau, and Southeast Asia, they too figured out in no time at all, keep it sweet, keep it crispy, deep fry, deep fry, sweet and spicy sauces, they knew what to do. Don't make it too authentic. The chop suey age gave way to the Hunan Sichuan phenomenon of the 1970s. The first Panda Inn restaurant opened in 1973, and this led to the founding of Panda Express 10 years later. Today, the strip malls and shopping malls across America all contain either a Panda Express, a Manchu Wok, Chinese Gourmet Express, Pei Wei, or P.F. Chang. The days that I grew up in where old-fashioned chop suey still reigns supreme were gone. It's a lot better now than it ever was. And now in the big cities, many years after Chinese immigration to the U.S. really took off, dishes that were rarely ever seen on these shores are now available. I mean, I could drive 30 minutes to Roland Heights and get Dao Xiaomian, Xinjiang food, local favorites of Shanxi, Chengdu, Chongqing, Taiwan, Beijing... You name it, it's all here. And in almost all cases, the businesses were started by some China immigrant. And that's what makes up the common thread that ties this whole history of Chinese cuisine in America. The whole phenomenon of Chinese restaurants, no matter where, in the United States or Amsterdam, Paris or New Delhi, almost always go hand in hand with the Chinese immigrant experience. This was certainly most true here in the U.S., A lot of stories will probably never get told about the brave ones who left the safety and comfort of New York and San Francisco to venture into the heartland of America to try their luck in towns like Tucson, El Paso, St. Louis. How many Chinese communities, big and small, have been spawned throughout this great land that can trace their earliest days in America to a Chinese restaurant? These days, we're getting more PhDs, entrepreneurs, scientists, and engineers from China than people who are opening up Chinese takeaways, but I thought it might be a nice topic to look at from a historical point of view. Fortune cookies, by the way, were not a Chinese invention. Originally, the fortune cookie, that is, the the shape, the taste, the, uh, the idea of inserting a piece of paper inside with some message, this is actually a Japanese thing. They used to make these Tea cakes, as they were called, by hand, 1,000 cookies per hour, until some Korean engineer for Kitamura in Japan figured out a machine that spits these things out, 6,000 per hour. They were called Tsujiura Senbei. It's said when the U.S. government locked the Japanese up inside the internment camps in California during World War II. These bakeries that made these fortune cookies changed to Chinese hands, and then once the 
price had come down sufficiently by 1967, they became the, the free giveaway items that you know came with the check. General Tso's chicken, that's another one of those things. I've mentioned this two times already in other podcasts. Tso Tsong Tang was a protege of Tsung Guo Fan, and he played a key role in preserving the Qing dynasty by helping to defeat the Taiping rebels. In China, he is remembered as one of the great military men of recent Chinese history. In America, we know him for his chicken dish that he probably never ate, but might be pleased to know immortalized his name in this land. General Tso's chicken had everything and everything an American might ever want in a single dish. Chunks of deep-fried, boneless chicken, nice and crispy, a tangy sauce, sautéed garlic, a little ginger and chili peppers, and the fact that Tso Tsong Tang was from Hunan. It really gave this dish the necessary gravitas to assure you that it was wholly authentic to that province. Like everything associated with the great innovation in Chinese-American cuisine, there's a story behind General Tso's chicken. Chef Peng of the Peng Yuan restaurant in the Changsha Great Wall Hotel invented the dish in the mid-50s in uh, Taipei. He later opened a place in New York that was a favorite of Henry Kissinger. The local New York News did a story on Chef Pung and the story behind his General Tso's chicken that put that that whole craze into afterburner. The craze for General Tso's chicken and this new wave of Chinese food has lasted into the 21st century. Chinese food in America has been mainstream for decades now and has long melted into the American pot of popular culture. That's all I got for you this time, my friends. I promise next time the topic will have nothing to do with the United States and we'll be back to the real deal with Chinese history. From the whole research team, editors, and technical staff here at the China History Podcast, I'd like to wish everyone a happy new year and may 2014 bring all of you the best of everything. This is Laszlo Montgomery signing off from Claremont, California. 78 degrees today and as sunny and beautiful as a day can be. I hope you'll consider joining in next time for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.